Well, good morning and welcome to Parish Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you've joined us for Lord's Day worship. And if you've noticed, the, the tune that, that the worship team was playing there is for a new Psalm 3 to us tune. So just pay careful attention as we get towards the end of the service as we sing our, our scripture passage this morning at the end of the service. Looking forward to that. And we have the delight as well to have Pastor Mike Finema come bring his word, the word of the Lord from Psalm 3 to us this morning. What a delight, brother. Well, we are invited into worship this morning with this gospel invitation from Revelation 7. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. With that vision before us, let us stand and sing. <clears throat> the Lord. Sing, Sing to, the to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let us praise his name with dancing. Let us make melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For, For the, the Lord, Lord takes pleasure in his people. people. He, he adorns, adorns the humble with salvation. salvation. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen.
of Jesus Christ, our scripture reading from 2 Samuel 15. And a messenger came to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly, and bring down ruin on us, and strike this city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servant said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. So the king went out, and all his household after him. And the king left ten concubines to keep the house. And the king went out, and all the people after him. And they halted at the last house. And all his servants passed by him. And all the Cherethites, and all the Pelethites, and all the six hundred Gettites who had followed him from Gath, passed on before the king. And all the land wept aloud as all the people passed by. And the king crossed the brook of Kidron, and all the people passed on toward the wilderness. And Abiathar came up, and behold, Zadok came also with all the Levites, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they sat down the ark of God until the people had all passed out of the city. Then the king said to Zadok, carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
of the Lord from Psalm 3. This is a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. O Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Selah. I lay down and slept. I woke again. For the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek, you break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Selah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As a parent, one of my joys, especially when my kids were little, was to be able to carry them upstairs, go to their bed with them, tuck them in at night, say their prayers, maybe sing a song, pull that blanket up over them, and kiss them goodnight. Um, Boys and girls, don't you love it? Especially when maybe you're afraid or scared, maybe there's a thunderstorm. When your parents come and tuck you in, they whisper in your ear, everything's going to be all right. They pray with you, and then as you drift off to sleep, knowing that you're safe and secure uh, because your parents are there with you. David has that experience that he shares with us here in Psalm chapter 3. A time when God tucked him in to sleep, and a time when he was afraid. He was in dire circumstances, and God reminded him uh, of his presence and of his salvation. And that's one of the things that we get to experience this morning as we walk through Psalm 3. Uh, As we do, would you please bow your heads and, and pray with me? Our most gracious God and our Father in heaven, I pray that as we walk through Psalm 3 this morning, that the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, will be pleasing and honoring in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And it's in Jesus' name alone that we pray. Amen. I would never claim to be a a Hebrew poetry scholar, Um, but I will say this. uh, Psalm 3 that we have before us this morning is a very clear chiasm. Uh, And what that means is that there's certain sections of the psalm that actually uh, coincide. Maybe they parallel or they contrast, and they come to a point. And so... um, I'm going to walk us through that briefly this morning. It's going to get a little technical, um, but it's really helpful for us as we understand uh, how David um, is clearly communicating to us through this psalm. And so, first of all, we see five clear sections in this 
poem, uh, which is also a song and a prayer uh, all at the same time. Uh, our first section is verses 1 and 2. Uh, the second section is verses 3 and 4. Then 5 and 6. And finally, 7 and then 8. Um, what we'll see is that verses 1 and 2, uh, the beginning and the end, verse 8, they contrast each other. David goes from one place, um, emotionally, mentally, uh, spiritually, um, a place of, of, struggle, uh, of struggle where he feels like there's no salvation, uh, to a place of confidence because he knows that salvation uh, is from the Lord. And we're going to see what causes this change, this drastic difference between the beginning and the end. Um, in the second section, verses 3 and 4, and then a parallel in verse 7, um, we see this word, but, uh, where David, despite his circumstances, remembers the truth of God, and he cries out in prayer. Um, and God answers from his holy hill, which is even a reference back to Psalm 2, which we looked at last week. And we'll explore more of that uh, in a minute as well. Um, but then we come to verse 7. Um, verse 7 is the specifics of the prayer that he cries out, where David says, Arise, save, and he calls God to action through imperatives. And we'll talk about what, why it's important that those are imperatives and he calls on God, uh, knowing that he will strike and God will break. Uh, he knows exactly what God can and will do uh, because of this deep relationship that David has with the Lord. Um, and then we'll get to verses 5 and 6, finally, and that's the fulcrum. It's kind of the point where everything is driving. Uh, it's the point where the entire psalm actually turns. Uh, in the midst of a very dire situation, David lays down. David sleeps, and it's the Lord who wakes him up. And he does this because he doesn't have any fear. The Lord is sustaining him. And that's the point of this psalm this morning. David is so secure. He's so confident. He is being sustained by God so that he can actually lay down and sleep uh, without fear. He isn't swayed by his present circumstances. He's not swayed by the false claims that people are, uh, are um, communicating to him. He firmly trusts that salvation belongs to the Lord. And as we look at this, we can also see that we can rest. We can trust. We can believe. We can find comfort in God's salvation no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in as well. So like a good Presbyterian, I've got three points this morning. David uh, laid it out very easily for us uh, with three sections, and we've got three points. Uh, the first one is uh, lies versus truth. And we're going to look at uh, verses 1 and 2, and then the contrast in verse 8. But first we need to understand the situation with Absalom. Um, uh, we read it in our scripture reading earlier, a little portion of it. This story is complex. I encourage you to go back to uh, 2 Samuel 15 and, and following and kind of read the entirety of the story. I'm going to try to summarize it. Um, there will be parts that I leave out. Uh, so I encourage you to, to finish uh, the rest of the story. But what happens is Absalom, one of David's sons, uh, begins a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy of manipulation where he seeks to steal the hearts of the people, and he does it very successfully. David realizes that the threat this son is, is uh, portraying, it's, it's growing, and he decides that it's time for him to flee, to leave the city, to leave Jerusalem. And it's not an easy decision for David and there's great weeping, which we read this morning. Uh, the people are weeping. Uh, David is weeping. It's his son. It's someone that he loves, someone so close to him, someone who's so dear. And yet, 
he has uh, conspired against David, his father. And it feels like betrayal. How could someone so close do this to him? Uh, the story, like I said, it's complex. Basically, what happened is a battle ensues, as you would imagine. Uh, David asks for his men, those who are loyal to him, he asks them to please be kind, show kindness to my son, uh, to deal gently with him. And there's very particular moments throughout the, the battle that God's hand is very clearly seen, uh, God's hand of providence in that. Uh, what ends up is Absalom uh, has to, to run. He's on the run. He has to flee. And he ends up hanging by something that is a source of his own pride. Uh, he ends up hanging in a tree by his hair because he got caught as he was fleeing away. And as he's hanging there, uh, he is actually run through by one of David's men and he dies. Um, it's a very sad ending. David and his men prevail. But as you can imagine, it's not a, um, David's not uh, rejoicing in this victory. It's a sad day. Uh, because he's lost his son. Uh, David weeps for Absalom. And David writes this psalm uh, at the beginning of this ordeal. He doesn't know how it's going to play out. He doesn't know what's going to happen. Um, he finds himself in a, a place of great sadness, of uh, a dire circumstance. He fears for his own life, and he actually has fear for the life of his son. He does not know what may happen. Uh, David finds himself in situations that we often find ourselves. Um, if you are alive and breathing this morning, uh, you found yourself in circumstances that may have been less than ideal. Um, like David, maybe you find yourself in a position where you have a prodigal child. And you don't know how that situation is going to play itself out. Uh, maybe you find yourself in the midst of physical trials, relational difficulties. Um, maybe you find yourself uh, suffering through other trials, like being in a wheelchair. Um, I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege here. Um, one of the things that... Uh, <coughs> maybe a gift that God has given me through this is um, when people see my obvious suffering and trial, um, it allows them to open up and share some of the things that they've been experiencing or some of the things that they go through. Um, but typically in the midst of the conversation, um, they, they throw this line out there. Now, I know that that's nothing compared to what you're going through. And my response is, it doesn't matter. Um, the, the trials and the struggles, the situation you find yourself in, is difficult. Uh, we don't need to compare which is worse. Um, I wouldn't go to David and say, uh, well, what I'm going through in this wheelchair is nothing compared to you because I don't know what it's like to have a prodigal son who's trying to kill me. So I guess your situation is worse and mine doesn't really matter. Um, where God has us does matter. Um, and it's significant. Uh, we don't have to compare. Um, what we're going through is is often difficult, and our circumstances are our own. Uh, but in the midst of that, what David gets to a point at is not um, listening to the voices of people around him. Um, instead, he gets to a point in verse 8 where he says, Salvation belongs to the Lord. He doesn't remain stuck in his present circumstance. He doesn't believe the lies that he's hearing. Uh, instead, David knows the truth. And it shows that he knows the truth in how he deals with his son, Absalom. David decides to flee Jerusalem rather than fighting. And Matthew Henry, in his commentary, says this, It seems cowardly that David would flee from Absalom, that he would quit his royal city before he had even had one struggle for it. And yet, by this psalm, it appears he was full of true courage, arising from his faith in God. True Christian fortitude consists more in a gracious security and a serenity of mind, in patiently bearing and patiently waiting, rather than in daring enterprises with sword in hand. 
So David shows great courage, not in picking up the sword, but in allowing God to do the battle for him. We've got several other biblical examples of God doing battle for his people. Uh, A couple of them in the book of Daniel. Um, Some pretty famous ones. Remember Daniel in the lion's den? Um, Daniel was placed in the lion's den because he continued to pray to God. He defied the decree of the king. And when the king threw him in, he had great sadness. And he hoped and prayed that Daniel would be rescued. The next morning when the king comes, this is what he says to Daniel. He says, Daniel, O servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel said to the king, O king, may you live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. Earlier in the book of Daniel, we read the famous story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were required to bow before the golden image of the king. And if they didn't, they'd be thrown into the fiery furnace. They refused. And as they were being taken to the king, being threatened to thrown, uh, being thrown into the furnace, they respond to the king this way. They said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. They allowed God to do battle for them, and he rescued them out of the furnace. So what we see here is David in a very difficult situation. He's in dire circumstances, and it's very real. Um, He hears lies. People are telling him there's no salvation, and he chooses not to believe it. Um, He doesn't allow them to become his truth. He doesn't get stuck in his present circumstance. Instead, he gets to the place where he can declare salvation belongs to the Lord. The question is, how does he get there? How does he get from the beginning to the end? Uh, We see in the the second section, that's our point, uh, number two, is that the way that he gets there is through prayer. He starts by saying, but you, O Lord, you are a shield about me. He reminds himself of the truth. He knows the Lord. He has a relationship with him. He says, but you, O Lord, who's he going to listen to, the people around him, or is he going to listen to the Lord? the Lord. Um, And he recalls God's word to his ancestor, to Abram, where God says to Abram in Genesis chapter 15, he says, fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. David calls to mind that this is for God's glory, that God is his glory, that God is the lifter of his head. It's not David's position as king. David's glory is not in his palace or in his city. David's glory is not in his dynasty. Instead, David's glory is in the Lord. And the Lord is the one who lifts his head when he has his head down, discouraged because of his circumstance, because of what people are saying. God is the one who lifts his chin who licks him in the eye, and God is the one who tells David, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And David cries out to God, and he knows that God will answer him from his holy hill. We looked at that last week in Psalm 2, verse 6, where David knows that God has set up his king on his holy hill. David may not be there right now, but it is the place where God dwells. As we read in our passage earlier today, David sends the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, back to the Holy Hill, because that's where God dwells. And he has confidence in that. He knows that God will do what God will do. And then as we jump down to verse 7, the parallel, we see the specifics of David's prayer. He calls on God to arise 
and to save. These words are, uh, these verbs are in the imperative. It's, uh, it's like God, uh, David is calling God or telling God to do what he knows that only God can do. And he puts these in the imperative. And Eugene Peterson, in his book on the Psalms called Answering God, he says the imperative, it's a confession of inadequacy. Because imperatives call to another to do for me what I cannot do for myself. David knows that he cannot save himself. Instead, he cries out to God to fight his battle for him. Now notice, David doesn't say, God, give me the strength so I can fight. Instead, he says, arise, save. The battle belongs to the Lord. Verse 8 in this psalm is quoted by another individual who also find himself in a very difficult situation. Uh, He found himself in dire straits. He had disobeyed the Lord. He had experienced a violent storm and suddenly found himself where most people have never been, and that's in the belly of a giant fish. And as Jonah prays to the Lord, he concludes his prayer by saying, Salvation belongs to the Lord. He knew that there was no way out of that fish unless the Lord would save him. And he did. Because salvation belongs to the Lord. But if David calls on God to fight his battles, if David calls on God to arise and to save, David knows that God's going to fight the battle in the way that God wants, uh, not in the way that David desires. Uh, In 2 Samuel 15, uh, we see that as the priest Zadok came out with the Ark of the Covenant, David told him to send it back, to bring it back into the city. He says, carry the Ark of God back, back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you. Behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. David realized that his version of salvation might be very different than God's version of salvation. What if God's version of arise and save is different than what David thought? What if God's version of arise and save is different than what we desire? Um, Salvation doesn't mean that things were going to be easy and David was going to be happy. Um, David lost his son. It was a day of great sadness. Um, David realized that salvation also doesn't mean that he would receive rescue from his immediate circumstances. It's not always the case. What if what is truly best for us, what if our salvation is not easy and happy, but God's glory being displayed in us and us being made more and more into the image of Christ? What if our salvation means our sanctification? What if God's desire is not to save us from trial, uh, but to be with us in trial? You know, when David writes Psalm 23, he has this beautiful description of God with us, walking with us in the valley of the shadow of death. He doesn't say that God rescues us from the valley of the shadow of death. Um, He says that he's present with us in it. Um, So what if our salvation looks like looks like um, a life in a wheelchair? Um, 
What if our salvation looks like uh, a life or a marriage where your spouse who you desire to change doesn't? Or a life of singleness when you honestly desire marriage? Uh, What if it, like David, is a prodigal who doesn't return? A life of chronic pain or disease a life where you pray for your situation and your circumstances to change, um, but God doesn't answer that prayer in the way that you desire. Um, It's in those moments that I turn to the book of Habakkuk. (laughs) Don't you guys always turn to the book of Habakkuk in those situations? Um, But Habakkuk 3, verses 17 and 18 speak so clearly to this, where the prophet says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the produce produce of the olive fail and the the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will take joy in the God of my salvation. You know, in David's circumstance, and in his his situation, his circumstances did change. Um, David knew that ultimately God would strike, that he would break, um, that all his enemies would be destroyed. And in David's situation, that did happen. Um, Absalom's uprising was put down. Unfortunately, it was at the cost of Absalom's life. Uh, David did return to the throne. Um, he returned to his city. Um, And this is a foreshadow of what is to come because as we've been talking about through these Psalms, David is a type of Christ. He is a type of Messiah. And ultimately what we'll see in a minute is that all of God's enemies are going to be destroyed. But before we get there, we've got to come to point three. And that's the fulcrum. That's the the point that David is driving at in this psalm. In the middle of it all, David is so secure that he can rest. In the middle of it all, David rests because he is so secure. In the middle of it all, David can rest without fear because God is sustaining him. You know how hard it is to rest, to actually sleep? in a situation like David found himself, in a situation that was so dire where he feared for his life and the life of his son, David sleeps. As you get to know me, you'll know that uh, I can rarely go a sermon without bringing in uh, a reference to the Lord of the Rings. So here we go this morning. Um, um, In the third book, in Return of the King, they're on the, the edge of probably the greatest and most significant battle of their time. Pippin and Gandalf are staring over the edge, uh, looking at the field of battle before them uh, on, uh, in Minas Tirith, um, knowing that everything that, that has been happening is converging to this point. And it's one of the greatest battles that they will ever experience. Pippin doesn't like to be in a battle. Um, He's small, um, and as he looks out, he, he reveals his fear to Gandalf, and he says, Gandalf, it's so quiet. It's the calm before the storm, right? And Gandalf responds, it's the deep breath before the plunge. And Pippin responds, I don't want to be in a battle. But waiting on the edge of one that I can't escape, that's even worse. Uh, There's no sleep for Pippin that night. Um, But there was sleep for David in his his, uh, circumstance. David rests because he knows that the battle belongs to the Lord and he has nothing to fear. And it's not the the sleep that he gets of, oh, just rest up, make sure, uh, get some sleep so that you're rested up for the fight. Um, 
This sleep is the sleep that is described in Psalm 46, verse 10 and 11, where David can be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. David knows that the Lord of hosts is with us, that the God of Jacob is our fortress. The battle belongs to the Lord, and David has nothing to fear. Our call this morning isn't to just be like David, that whatever situation you find yourself in, it's okay, just take a nap. God's going to take care of everything. Um, What we're going to see is that we have something that David didn't. Um, We have a a more full representation, a more full understanding of the truth of the gospel. Um, We know the one that David was pointing to. Um, We know and we have seen and we understand the the story of Jesus. Is David is pointing to him in the truth of the gospel. Uh, Like David, Jesus had many foes. Even those who were some of the closest to him. Now, David had um, David had his mighty men. He had his family around him. Uh, Jesus had his disciples, twelve men that he had chosen to live life with. But in Jesus' moment of greatest need, where were his disciples? They couldn't even stay up and pray with him as he was in the garden. There was one that betrayed him. There was one who denied him. And all of them, in his moment of greatest need, deserted him. The people who he came to save, God's people, they cried, crucify him. They mocked him as he hung dying. They said, oh, he saved others. Let's see if he can save himself. And like David before him, he cried out to God. In the garden, he said, Father, if this is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And in his dying breath, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He cried out to the Lord. And God answered him like he answered David. And he answered from his holy hill. But he didn't answer him by removing the circumstances. Instead, God was present with his son through it. And in that moment, Jesus laid down his life. And like David, he slept. But he slept the sleep of death for three days. And on that glorious Sunday morning, like David, the Lord woke him up and he raised him from the grave. And through it, God defeated all of his enemies, all of our enemies, sin, evil, Satan, even death itself. Because God made Jesus arise, just like the prayer of David And through Jesus, it is God who saves. He strikes our enemies on the cheek. He breaks their teeth. He even crushes the head of the serpent, back from Genesis chapter 3. And because of that, we have so much to look forward to. We know this great salvation. that was read in our, our gospel invitation this morning, and I'm going to read it again and go a little further to get a fuller version of of what we have to look forward to. In Revelation chapter 7, we read this from John. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from every tribe and people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb then one of the elders addressed me saying who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come 
And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, Yes, these, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So from David this morning, these are the things that we learn. We learn that we don't have to believe the lies. When people are saying there's no salvation for us in God, we can know that that's not true. And we don't have to get lost in our circumstances. Yes, our foes are many, even those who are close to us. We're often tempted to believe what is false is true, but that's not the case. Instead, we can remember the truth. And we can cry out like David, like our Lord, like Jesus, we can cry out in truth, knowing that he fights our battles for us, and he's done that for us in Christ. And finally, because of Christ, we can simply rest in God. Like our children that we tuck in at night when they're afraid, God tucks us in. He covers us with a blanket of salvation through our, His Son, Jesus Christ, so that we can rest and trust without fear because we know that salvation belongs to the Lord and blessings are on His people. It's not always in the way that we desire, but it's always in a way that brings Him honor and glory. and It's in a way that brings us salvation. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our most gracious God and our Father in heaven. Lord, when we cry out like David, and when we see our foes around us, and they are so many, and when we hear uh, the lies that there is no salvation for us, I pray that we would, uh, that you would bring to, to mind, that you would remind us of the truth, that you are a shield about us, that you lift up our heads and you answer us from your holy hill. That you are a God who arises and saves us. And that you destroy all of our enemies. You break the teeth of the wicked. That salvation belongs to you. And in the midst of that, may we lay down and sleep and rest and trust. Because we know that you sustain us. Uh, Father, I pray that you would take away our fear. Instead, that we may rest and trust in you. But Lord, we know that often, as is the case with us, uh, we look at the circumstances that are around us and we have fear. We believe the lies. We doubt. We, we fear. Um, and Father, in those circumstances which... Honestly, we act in that way more often than we, we would like to admit. Uh, we confess our lack of faith and trust in you and our lack of ability to, to rest in you. And so, Lord, to you this morning we come confessing. Lord, we pray that you would have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. We have an assurance of pardon. This morning it comes from Ephesians and from Colossians. We're reminded of the truth of the gospel in Jesus. But God, those precious words... But God, 
being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is the promise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, in the same way you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so continue to walk in him. So So then, we are rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Therefore, let us abound in thanksgiving. Let us stand together and sing.
belongs to the Lord. And every saint to all eternity, this will be our song. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And when Jesus gave us a meal, he gave us the same truth. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And for Jesus' case, salvation belongs to me. And as he was eating with his disciples on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. This is our salvation that belongs to the Lord. Likewise, after dinner, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So everyone who does not rest in themselves and you have no place to go, when you're threatened by enemies and you're dealing with your own sins, run to the table where we see that salvation belongs to God. And we're saved by good news. It's news. That's it. We have nothing left to do except to hear and receive. If you're not a Christian, if you don't have a resting place from your sins, well, come to Jesus. We have such a picture of faith here. David was able to lie down and sleep. That is what faith is. I look at what Jesus has done. There's nothing left for me except to go to sleep and rest in what he's done. So come to Christ and find rest. Father, we thank you that we have a shield. We have a resting place in the midst of all of our fears and struggles and sins. There's a place where we can lay down and sleep and wake again because you have given your son. And so, God, we ask you to give us more of Jesus this morning. And as we come to this table, we ask you to give us the body and blood of Christ by faith. Lord, we, we need you. That is all our life and all our hope. So help us to rest in him, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have three tables, one on each side, one in the middle. On a white plate, there's gluten-free bread. And then for the, the juice is on the outer ring and wine is in the middle. Come to the table of his grace and taste again that salvation belongs to the Lord.
caring for family members, and particularly our brother David, who is away to minister to his own father and heart. Bless him. Strengthen him. Supply him with the comfort and grace that he needs. Lord, we pray for our federal and local magistrates that you would lead them in truth that they might lead in your truth. And that the good and propagation of the gospel would go forth in power through this land. Oh, Lord, we pray that as we seek your face, we would pray just as our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing. <laughs> receive the Lord's benediction from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Christ who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father unto him be glory. Well, we have several announcements in your newsletter. Go ahead and read that. There's Kingdom Tide. You can sign up on your way out. 
There's an event for a training for women um, going through the Bible and Bible study with the Simeon Trust. Fantastic group. Information is in your newsletter. And there's a Reformation Day party coming up. So look, at, look through this for everything coming up. And we have a building announcement. So, Mike, would you make that one? So just to bring you all up to speed on uh, progress, not only with the building, but with fundraising, um, this is the total, uh, current total for a Rise and Build campaign, including pledges and one-time gifts of people given is $3.346 million. Um, total cash in our accounts, we have about $1.8 million in our accounts. Um, our intention is we're meeting as a session to, uh, Monday night and we have the finance committee looking at the feasibility of paying off our current mortgage for our land and building with some of that cash. Um, we have uh, some money still to raise, as Mike Masterberti has mentioned before, and we have a group of people meeting to talk about um, next steps and how we're gonna get over the finish line and get the remaining cash or collateral, whatever we need to uh, get bridge financing to move forward with construction. If you have questions, please ask Mike or I. Um, Jamie, Brian are not involved in the day to day, so please come to us if you have questions. Emails, call us. Our numbers are in the bulletin, email address, whatever, fine. Thank you. Go forth in Christ's peace. Amen. <laughs>
downtown. Like random stuff, yeah, historical stuff. There's a lot of there's a lot of like because it was a big railway and shipping on, on the river, so there's a lot of that. Like, 